Well, I, I suppose we should get started. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for VAMOS today. It is my pleasure uh, to introduce Professor Tanya Zelovinsky from Columbia University. Uh, Tanya has a wide reaching background in AMO precision measurements, including uh, precision atomic spectroscopy, optical lattice clocks, nuclear CP violation in molecules, uh, and much more. Many of these efforts leverage her strengths in developing new methods of optical control, such as molecular laser cooling, quantum state controlled photo dissociation, uh, and optical frequency synthesis, to name a few. The molecular clock you'll hear about today combines the intrinsic sensitivity of molecules to new fundamental physics uh, with advanced ultra-cold control, which is something that many research groups are trying to realize, uh, but Tanya has been doing for a few years now uh, and setting a pretty high bar for the rest of us. Uh, Tanya is a fellow of the American Physical Society uh, and has received the Francis M. Pipkin Award and NSF Career Award uh, and the Presidential Early Career Award for Scientists and Engineers. Uh, as a reminder, viewers can ask questions using the Q&A feature in Zoom uh, or via the YouTube chat feature. Please join me in welcoming Tanya. Um. Great, uh, thank you very much, uh, Nick, for uh, introducing me and for inviting me to join you for this uh, very exciting seminar series and for giving me a chance to talk about uh, our work at Columbia. And today I'll focus on um, our work with ultra cold molecules um, and in, uh, in particular on using um, these molecules for precision measurements and metrology. And I apologize, my cursor is having some problems. So I'll try to verbally point out where things are on the slide. So uh, yes, quantum science with molecules has uh, really taken off in recent years. Um, and applications of ultra cold molecules include uh, basic chemical processes, um, as well as quantum uh, simulations, quantum materials, and even applications in fundamental physics. Um, and the key is being able to control uh, the molecular quantum states to a very high degree. Some of the applications of the molecules have um, perhaps different intellectual motivations, but they share some common challenges. Uh, for example, building successful qubits and uh, high quality clocks uh, both require maintaining very long um, coherence times between the quantum states. And this is something that I'll focus on today. So um, here are uh, of the questions that uh, we address through the, the research that I'll talk about today. Uh, so we would like to um, understand if uh, small molecules can contribute um, to our understanding of fundamental forces. And this includes both um, kind of uh, uh, new undiscovered physics and also old physics that plays uh, a really critical role in high precision measurements and also in our understanding of atomic and molecular structure. Uh, we're uh, exploring uh, whether it's possible to control uh, molecules across uh, a large range um, of electromagnetic spectrum uh, and also how to decouple their internal dynamics from the environment for the most precise uh, quantum control. And finally, uh, we're also investigating whether there is any metrological advantage for using molecular versus atomic systems. So the, the first task in working with ultra cold molecules is of course creating them. And uh, two pathways are used uh, to create uh, samples of molecules at uh, the micro Kelvin temperatures. Uh, so one method is to directly cool uh, molecules uh, that usually contain an alkaline earth uh, metal optical cycling center. So these are um, the metals from group two and the metal is typically bound to a halogen uh, like fluorine or to hydrogen. And it's even possible to substitute the halogen or hydrogen with either a diato uh, diatomic or a polyatomic uh, functional group, which can give access to larger polyatomic molecules. Uh, and the second method is to laser cool atoms 
which usually are the alkali metals in group one. And then these ultra cold atoms are then assembled into diatomic molecules in their ground state with um, magnetic or optical fields. Uh, but alkaline earth metals in group two uh, uh, have many features that are very attractive for both laser cooling and for metrology. And it happens that these features also transfer onto the bound molecules that are composed of these atoms. Um, uh, but uh, these atoms don't have any unpaired uh, electron spins and therefore are difficult to control with magnetic field. Um, and therefore it may be difficult to create the dimers of these atoms. But we've solved this problem by uh, using um, just all optical methods uh, to create uh, ensembles of um, diatomic strontium molecules in their ground state. And these are quite unique ultra cold molecules. Uh, they have purely uh, van der Waals uh, interatomic potentials in the ground state. So these ultra cold um, van der Waals dimers, uh, the strontium two, uh, they, they have two uh, key features to keep in mind. Uh, so firstly, uh, I'll show the potential. So here on the left is the ground state potential X singlet sigma G, uh, and also the lowest lying pair of um, excited potentials with the threshold at the intercombination line, strontium. Uh, and this intercombination line corresponds to the singlet S to the triplet P1 transition. Uh, the pair of potentials is, um, uh, is called zero U and one U. So um, one important property of the molecules is the presence of very narrow optical transitions that are of the singlet to triplet type. Uh, and this provides a powerful uh, capability for quantum state control. Um, and actually uh, it's not shown here, but there is another series of forbidden transitions um, in the optical. Um, so these are th these would be not G to U, but G to G transitions. They're very narrow because they're forbidden by the molecular inversion symmetry. Um, so, um, and the second uh, important property that I'd like to point out here is the completely spinless molecular ground state for uh, bosonic strontium isotopes. So um, the relative uh, simplicity of this potential is really an advantage for precise metrology and also for ab initio calculations. Uh, to uh, illustrate points about the this ground state uh, van der Waals potential, here you see uh, the ab initio calculated potential that's shown with red points and the experimental potential uh, derived from traditional spectroscopy that's shown with the blue line. And there's a very good agreement here at the level of uh, below 1%. Okay. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, one way to create ultra cold molecules is to assemble them from atoms that are laser cooled to micro Kelvin temperatures using light or magnetic field. Um, our strontium dimers are uh, created by optically making excited state dimers, which then spontaneously decay to the electronic ground state. And since the photons take away the binding energy, um, the molecules that are left behind are still at a few micro Kelvin. And since, uh, again, since strontium atoms are non-magnetic, we use only optical techniques to create the molecules. The molecules are trapped in a one-dimensional optical lattice, uh, which is uh, simply a standing wave of uh, retro-reflected light. Um, so initially, the lattice tightly holds the atoms in the bright uh, micro traps or in the lattice pancakes. And then the molecules are also created in the lattice, preserving the original um, micro Kelvin temperature that we started with. Uh, any probing light propagates uh, along the lattice axis to suppress any Doppler dephasing. Uh, this is the setup we use to create uh, strontium molecules by laser cooling an atomic beam uh, that you can see near the top. Uh, and then trapping the atoms in an optical lattice and photo associating them. Uh, so this picture is a bit outdated, but now at least a dozen laser systems are used for creating the molecules, trapping them and probing them. 
Uh, so uh, earlier I mentioned that the strontium molecules uh, give us access to very narrow but useful optical transitions. Um, I'd like to expand a little bit on what we have gained from these forbidden transitions, especially the insight into basic molecular physics. Here's a, a schematic of an optical transition from a uh, rotation-free level in the ground electronic state to a singly excited level near the intercombination threshold. This upper level has a Zeeman splitting um, in uh, weak magnetic fields of a few Gauss, uh, sort of standard uh, megahertz level splitting. And from uh, linear Zeeman shifts, uh, we uh, could very precisely determine uh, the mixing coefficient between the two potentials that converge at the inner combination threshold. Um, and here uh, in the bottom left, you see a typical Zeeman spectrum uh, for, the, for that excited state. And it uh, appears to be extremely asymmetric. Um, and it turns out that this is the case because of the huge uh, quadratic Zeeman shifts that these molecules experience. Um, these actually exceed the quadratic Zeeman shift in strontium atoms by a factor of a million. And um, you can see clearly um, the curvature uh, even at a couple of Gauss in the plots on the right. Um, and we found that this behavior um, is strongly linked to the long range of dipole-dipole interaction. And the unusual um, behavior of these Zeeman shifts uh, sometimes uh, served as a stronger test of the molecular model than spectroscopy alone. And I think it also nicely illustrates uh, quite a striking difference between a weakly bound dimer and just a, a pair of atoms. This intercombination transition has also proven to be uh, an incredibly useful tool in imaging the molecules and uh, studying uh, quantum state resolved uh, photochemistry. Uh, in this case, the optical transition is from a ground state bound level to the singly excited uh, continuum and uh, potentially also back down to the ground state continuum where the molecule uh, is split into fragments. And on the bottom left, uh, here's a photo dissociation spectrum, uh, which is very narrow because of the long lived excited continuum. And the images show the side view of the emerging molecular fragments. But instead of looking from the side, uh, when we instead image these exploding molecules by looking into the symmetry axis of the trap, uh, we observe very non-classical angular distributions that show a uh, very clear matter wave interference. As you can see in these images where uh, one is calculated and the other is experimental. Uh, and this type of interference is really a key feature of ultra cold reactions. The quantum states of the fragmented molecule is uh, completely determined by the well-known initial quantum state of the molecule and of the photons. So by selecting the, their quantum states, we can completely control the shape of the resulting partial waves. Um, and uh, we've also used this technique to um, probe the continuum with a very high sensitivity to uh, features like reaction barriers and collisional resonances. Here are a couple of uh, specific examples of quantum interference effects in ultra cold photochemistry. So the, the strontium molecules here are dissociated into their ground state continuum uh, in a way that all the outgoing quantum states are completely known and uh, as well as their relative phase is known. And in both uh, these cases, we are essentially imaging different coherent superpositions of G wave spherical harmonics, which results in the eightfold uh, fragment patterns that you see. So the experimental images are shown on the top right of each square, uh, and the calculated predictions are illustrated in three different ways. Um, and the, this long-lived intercombination threshold uh, gives rise uh, to also a completely new type of uh, super narrow optical transition in the molecules, which is uh, actually absent in atoms. 
This is a transition uh, to the state with the same inversion symmetry as the ground state, uh, which is even or uh, gerade. Uh, this transition mechanism is magnetic dipole. And uh, the strength of this effect is proportional to the bond length of the molecule squared. Uh, and uh, this uh, results in two families of excited molecular state. One being a super radiant, which we think of as the sort of standard um, uh, molecular levels that we see, which are still quite long lived, about 10 microseconds, but their decay is electric dipole allowed. Um, and then the subradiant states uh, with lifetimes of order at 10 milliseconds, so, uh, three orders of magnitude longer. Uh, the subradiant uh, states uh, provide us with a with a really good handle for optical control of the molecular quantum states. So here we have uh, coherent optical Rabi oscillations on the left, and on the right is a long measured lifetime that's approaching 10 milliseconds for a subradiant state. This uh, subradiant and other long lived excited state in these molecules also present very interesting opportunities for metrology that we would like to explore. Uh, uh, the subradiant states are actually extremely useful for working with molecules that are trapped in an optical lattice. Uh, we can take a broad spectra of these states and see the expected uh, red and blue uh, lattice trap axial sidebands in addition to the narrow carrier. Um, and these uh, precise measurements of the axial uh, lattice trap frequency, um, they allow us to uh, uh, quite precisely calibrate the polarizability measurements for different molecular states, uh, which is important for coming up for optimal designs for molecular clocks. And also here zooming in on the carrier and measuring its asymmetric width um, uh, directly yields the temperature of the molecules. Okay, so uh, here we can pause and if there are any questions, uh, then I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. And just as a reminder, uh, everyone, you can use the Q&A feature uh, or the YouTube chat feature. We do have some questions. Uh, one is from Bill Phillips, uh, who is wondering uh, why there is such a huge quadratic Zeeman shift in these molecules. Um, yeah, so it tur turns out that um, this is related to the C3 interaction. So um, um, it's, it, it may not be very easy to explain intuitively, but uh, basically there are um, two, uh, you can think of it as two potentials that are getting very close to each other. And so you might think that there can be some very strong mixing and the closer they get, the stronger the mixing becomes. Uh, and uh, they get closer at further, the, the longer the, uh, you make the molecules, the closer they, they get because they approach the same threshold. Um, and then, uh, so you expect any effect that includes uh, mixing to scale with the size of the molecule. So uh, theoretically, this ends up scaling with the, I think, square of the bond length. Uh, and uh, the, when we measured it, uh, the strength of these transitions uh, experimentally, uh, we, it, it was exactly confirmed. Um, so um, yeah, so we expect some, some scaling with some power, but the exact power is given by the nature of the interaction, whether it's C3 or something similar. <clears throat> oh, thank you. And uh, we have another, uh, another question also from Bill Phillips. Uh, can you use the ab initio potentials uh, you showed to get scattering lengths? Are they, are they good enough? Um. Uh, well, I think in strontium, the scattering lengths are known well from experiment, basically. Um, yeah, that's a good question because you need a very high precision on the most weakly bound states. Uh, I think uh, the answer is probably yes, except for the one isotope where um, the bound state, the last bound state is very weakly bound. So that would be extremely sensitive to the exact position. So I would say for most isotopes, except maybe for that one. And maybe we have uh, time for one more. 
uh, from uh, uh, D.D. Legfried, can the quadratic Zeeman shift be used to manipulate the molecules in space, for example, using the stern gerlach effect? Um, uh, that's a good question. Yeah, we haven't considered it because our molecules are sitting in, uh, in the lattice. But uh, uh, yeah, uh, I, I mean, yeah, I think, I think you can use uh, the strong, the strong Zeeman shifts in these molecules for, for spatial manipulation, absolutely. Great, thank you. And uh, yeah, everyone, please use the use the Q and A in the YouTube chat. We'll have more opportunities for questions uh, later on. Yeah, yeah thank you. Uh, great. Uh, so so far, I described um, high resolution uh, spectroscopy of the molecules that were weakly bound, which is how they're initially created from the laser cooled atoms. But to make a full use of the molecular clock, uh, it's uh, important to be able to create the molecules in their absolute ground state. Uh, and in fact, we can now create ground state strontium-2, uh, the first ultra-cold molecule of this particular type. Um, and to do this, we momentarily switch off the lattice. And this uh, removes any decoherence from the light shifts and results in very narrow uh, EIT signals like the one shown here. This is uh, electromagnetically induced transparency where the pump and probe uh, coherently connect the highest and the lowest states in the ground state molecular potential. Um, and in this uh, free space environment, we implement STIRAP or a stimulated uh, Raman adiabatic passage. Uh, so as you can see on the, on the curve, uh, initially all molecules are in the most weakly bound state, so we, we call them negative one. Uh, then the resonant Raman lasers are smoothly pulsed on and off to transfer the molecules to the ground state, or B equals zero. Uh, we cannot see these uh, deeply bound molecules directly, so we reverse the stira process and recover the molecules um, in the, again in the weakly bound state. And from the number of the recovered molecules, we can deduce the one-way transfer efficiency in uh, which is roughly 45% in this trace. Uh, but with more laser power, the efficiency can certainly be increased. Uh, and uh, the blue line is a simulation based on the optical block equations where there are no free parameters. And here's the conceptual implementation of the molecular clock. Uh, it involves a pair of uh, vibrational clock states um, that each see the same trap depth in a so-called uh, magic optical lattice, and they're coherently coupled to each other. So since uh, direct vibrational transitions are strongly forbidden, uh, we drive a two-photon clock transition um, off resonantly coupling to a long-lived excited molecular state. Uh, this calculation shows the intrinsic lifetimes of various clock states as a function of their binding energy in the ground state molecular potential. Uh, the contributions here include natural decay channels and also black body radiation at room temperature. Uh, so the net lifetime shown with the gray points in the lowest trace uh, generally exceed uh, 10 to the five years. So the clock state coherence will certainly be set by technical limitations. And here the details of the Ground and excited uh, molecular potentials are shown in some more detail. Uh, the absolute ground state is bound by approximately a thousand wave numbers. Both probe lasers in the Raman configuration um, and the optical lattice are all phase locked to an optical frequency comb. So the clock states one and two are vibrational levels in the ground state. Uh, here, so here one is the most weakly bound, uh, while two is quite deeply bound. Uh, the clock states are, uh, as I mentioned, coupled by a coherent Raman transition, and uh, this transition is via an off-resonant intermediate state. Um, uh, the optical lattice frequency, which is shown here with the dashed yellow line, is red detuned from the inner combination threshold, so it's in the infrared. Uh, now let's focus on the relevant quantum states. Uh, in orange and blue are the upper and lower clock states, which here have vibrational numbers 62 and six. 
and no rotational angular momentum J. Uh, uh, moreover, this lattice is uh, near resonance with a transition from state two to uh, a deeply bound uh, long-lived row vibrational state in one U. So this state is highlighted in green. And when the molecules are in an infrared lattice, the clock states are both bound shifted in energy uh, and the molecules end up optically trapped. Um, generally, these clock states will see different trap depths and the clock transition will be light shifted and broadened due to the thermal spread of the molecules. But when the lattice frequency is deliberately uh, blue detuned from the green intermediate state, uh, the, the AC Stark shift pulls the blue and green states slightly closer together. Um, and at a specific lattice frequency, this uh, trap depth, uh, which I call U for clock state two, exactly matches um, the trap depth for clock state one. And this is the magic wavelength at which the clock state resonance very sharply narrows, since it's no longer limited by the inhomogeneous stark broadening. And one way to search for magic wavelengths is to measure the clock shift versus the trapping light power at various wavelengths uh, that are shown here in the different colors. The wavelength with a zero slope is magic, which is the red line here. Um, as we sweep the lattice uh, frequency through the narrow one u resonance, we can directly measure the AC stark shift of the deeply bound clock state too. Um, here we change the lattice frequency from five gigahertz below to five gigahertz above the resonance um, and see the dispersive um, stark shift curve. Uh, the green bar here shows the lattice detuning where the polarizabilities of the two clock states are equal, which would be the magic frequency. And uh, it's here uh, that we expect to see the narrowest clock resonance or the longest coherence time of the clock state superposition. And here we plot the actual clock uh, resonance line width. Uh, so its baseline is quite large, showing nearly 100 kilohertz width. Uh, due to lattice-induced broadening. And the line width increases as we approach the resonance, but at the magic frequency value on the blue side of the resonance, it drops quite dramatically, in fact, by over three orders of magnitude. Um, here are a couple of clock spectra on either side of the resonance, um, but, but both are away from the magic frequency. And we see the expected light shifts and broadening from the lattice light both on the order of 100 uh, kilohertz. But at the magic frequency, the resonance is symmetric um, and very narrow. And this is the zoomed in spectrum of the vibrational clock resonance at the magic lattice frequency. This resonance is 30 hertz wide, which is a 3000 fold improvement over a non-magic wavelength. And the resonance frequency for this clock state pair is uh, 25 terahertz. So the spectrum corresponds to the quality factor of eight times 10 to the 11. So besides uh, just using the narrow width of the clock resonance to quantify the coherence of the clock states in the magic lattice, we can um, directly drive a quantum Rabi oscillations between the clock states. So essentially the molecule then is made to oscillate between its tightly bound state and its weakly bound state with a long floppy bomb length. And a, a well-chosen magic frequency uh, can help us reach very long coherence times for this clock. So here is the Rabi oscillation between the molecules in vibrational states that are separated by nearly 30 terahertz. Uh, the oscillation here decays with a quite long time constant of 130 milliseconds. Um, and we're not yet limited by the two body collisional lifetime of the molecules that are shown here with the purple triangles for the upper clock state. But instead we are limited now by uh, the lattice induced loss of molecules in the lower clock state uh, that's shown with the red squares. And here's a more uh, careful look at the lifetime of that deeply bound clock state too. So away from the magic lattice frequency, it shows a typical two-body decay 
where as more than half of the molecules still remain after 100 milliseconds. Uh, and the magnitude of this two body loss coefficient beta is very typical for ultra cold molecule systems. But at the magic wavelength um, shown with the, the magenta squares, the loss is much more severe. And as you can see, almost no molecules remain by 100 milliseconds in this particular case. Um, and this, this magic lattice loss is exponential, um, which potentially indicates lattice light scattering. But uh, from our knowledge of the lattice driven transition, uh, we were not expecting to see such fast loss. Uh, so this very rapid loss can be uh, studied as a function of the lattice light intensity as shown in this uh, inset. Um, the, as, as, as you can see, the loss rate does increase with the lattice intensity, so the lattice light is a limiting factor. But the scattering seems to increase quadratically uh, with the uh, lattice power. So this is the red bit. Um, and this may point to uh, two photon uh, lattice induced uh, photo dissociation. So with our theory colleagues, we have looked into this process uh, and we found that that should most likely be weaker than what we observe. So um, the rapid light, uh, this lattice induced loss is, is not entirely understood right now. But that said, we do have a way to uh, design the clock to minimize this loss uh, by choosing an optimal one U state for the lattice driven transition. So in other words, we look for a magic frequency where the lattice is more detuned from uh, a given resonance. Um, so in practical terms, it should be detuned by more than about a gigahertz, which can help with a number of uh, technical issues. So this plot uh, uses colors to show the coupling strengths or a transition dipole moment squared between the ground state vibrational levels um, on the vertical axis and uh, one U excited states on the horizontal. And the brighter colors indicate stronger coupling. Uh, we see a typical pattern with two branches. Uh, and this arises because the molecule uh, spends most time at its inner and outer classical turning points. Uh, since we are interested in at least one deeply bound clock state, here I zoom in on the lower left corner. It shows coupling strength for the lowest 10 um, clock states. Um, and uh, so near the bottom of the potential, the energy structure is fairly harmonic. And this shows up in this uh, checkerboard pattern of low and high transition strengths. Um, our first experiment used the state pair highlighted with the white square, uh, which as you can see is relatively strong, but it doesn't sit on one of the branches. So for the next iteration, uh, where we uh, got the Rabi oscillation that I showed, we chose the black square for the magic lattice and the oscillations lasted four times longer. So, uh, I would like to uh, highlight here that um, identifying uh, this checkerboard pattern of uh, transition strengths um, actually helped us with the spectroscopy of the excited state um, and with assigning a quantum numbers to the spectra. So there are over 120 states in the excited uh, 1U potential. And this means that uh, despite the 1% precision of the ab initio calculations, we can't be sure of a state's vibrational quantum number only from its binding energy measurement. But this uh, distinctive pattern helps us um, identify the correct vibrational quantum number for the excited state. So here uh, in the plot, I show calculations uh, that correspond to row number six uh, in, the, in, the, in the color plot, and also precise measurements of several selected uh, transition strengths. Uh, so we find that there is a unique way to combine energy level spectroscopy with transition strengths to get the correct quantum state numbering. Um, and then the magic lattice detunings are measured in the bottom plot with the largest detuning uh, with the arrow, um, that, that one has produced the, the longest Rabi oscillation so far. 
Okay, uh, so I will pause for questions again if there are any. Thank you. We do have a couple questions. Uh, one is from Brandon Iritani. How do we understand the two body losses since uh, strontium-2 is non-reactive? Um, yeah, so that, that's a very good question. And I wouldn't say that we very well understand them. Um, it, you know, that's a, it's a, a very uh, kind of active, ongoing research question. What is actually happening to the molecules and why and how they're lost? Um, I would say that us, since it's a homonuclear molecule, um, I don't know if I would say it's non-reactive. Um, it's sort of at zero, it's, it's at that crossover between uh, endothermic and exothermic uh, because input and output have exactly the same energy, but it certainly can form uh, some kind of collisional complex, which may or may not be excited by the trapping light and get lost uh, uh, through that kind of mechanism. So. Uh, specifically what happens in strontium-2 is not known, but there seems to be some kind of uh, potentially universal mechanism because this uh, two-body loss coefficient seems to be very comparable across many different species, uh, whether they're uh, highly reactive or not. And so ours seem to fall right in that same range. Thank you. Uh, we have another question from Chris Panda. What limits the Styrap efficiency? So th this is a, ver a very actively being investigated right now. Um, in the plot that I showed, it, it may have been just the availability of more light. Uh, so I showed a very narrow EIT uh, scan. And um, so that, that blip is, is very narrow, but it's still a few kilohertz. So it means there's some residual decoherence. Um, so uh, you need uh, to do the steer up potentially faster, which means you need a little bit more power. Um, so if that decoherence is reduced further and or uh, there's more light power, then potentially we can get more efficiency. And I don't see a reason why we shouldn't be able to. All right, um, and uh, maybe the last question for this break. Um, are there issues, this is from Bill Phillips, are there issues as with atomic strontium with the magic wavelength being only approximately magic because of tensor shifts, uh, which would be difficult to avoid in, uh, if the lattice were 3D instead of 1D? Right, so a molecular clock here is really great in that sense because the clock states are purely J0 and there's no nuclear spin whatsoever in our isotope. So uh, no, there are no issues at all with being only partly magic as, as far as I know. Um, so only scalar shifts in this case. All right, thank you. And uh, yeah, we'll have time for questions again at the end. So everyone, please keep them coming. Okay, great. Uh, yeah, so uh, just a little bit more. Um, um, yeah, so our uh, current uh, implementation of the molecular clock is um, in fact already precise enough to start providing um, uh, useful results for the dimers of the dominant um, strontium-88 isotope, which is the one we're now using. So here is a fairly coarse uh, preliminary scan of the bottom of the ground state uh, van der Waals potential that's showing the seven lowest vibrational states. Um, and uh, in fact, we also have precise data on the top of the potential corresponding to vibrational numbers uh, that are above 60. This data was uh, collected using two photon Adler count spectroscopy as shown in this uh, sample scan, um, where uh, even the initial precision for uh, some of the selected uh, states here is more than four orders of magnitude higher than in the previous work. So um, more generally speaking, um, a molecular clock that provides uh, very precise measurements of the vibrational states is um, an excellent sensor of the interatomic force. So when the positions of the bound states are known with an uncertainty below a part per trillion, then uh, we can say that the interatomic potential and the binding force that holds the molecule together can be reconstructed with a similar precision. Um, and this is, of course, in addition to other exciting applications of the molecular clock, uh, such as metrology in the terahertz regime um, and measurements of the temporal stability of the electron. 
the proton mass ratio. Um, but uh, in terms of force sensing, um, high, uh, high precision uh, interatomic force sensing can even lead to discoveries of new physical forces. So for example, it may be possible to use molecular clocks to learn about gravity in the ultra short range. Um, our simple strontium molecules can be pictured as pairs of atoms separated by their bond length, which we can vary from about half to five nanometers. And this bond length is set mostly by um, electromagnetic interactions between all the electrons and nuclei. Um, and since the nuclei are relatively heavy, uh, Newtonian gravity also contributes and makes a very tiny correction to the bond. Um, and possible deviations from the Newtonian gravity can be parametrized, for example, using the exponential Yukawa term with a magnitude A and length scale lambda. Um, and from previous experiments that use uh, quasi-classical methods, we know that um, at the nanometer scale, A is smaller than uh, 10 to the power of 22. Okay, so in other words, there could be uh, a huge correction to regular gravity, and it wouldn't uh, contradict any experiments that have looked at interactions between spinless masses. Um, and we think that the molecular clock is a fully quantum system that has the potential to go to higher sensitivities. Um, now from the uh, theory point of view, uh, the possible fifth force would be uh, a small, uh, very small correction to the electromagnetic forces. Um, in the basic uh, Born-Oppenheimer picture, uh, the energy um, of a bound molecule consists of the electronic, uh, vibrational, and rotational contributions, although our molecules have no rotational energy. Um, and uh, in particular, the strontium-2 ground states potential supports uh, 63 bound states. Uh, the energy corrections beyond uh, the Born-Oppenheimer include adiabatic terms uh, proportional to mu, the electron to nucleus mass ratio, um, and uh, non-adiabatic, that's mu squared corrections, uh, various relativistic and QED corrections that can depend both on mu and the fine structure constant, and uh, finite nuclear size corrections that implicitly depend on the nuclear mass. Um, and uh, this uh, theory, is still under development, but uh, we believe it should be possible to uh, describe the leading order corrections analytically uh, with coefficients that can be uh, partially uh, fitted to the data, um, isolating um, mass dependencies that could uh, signal a gravity-like force. Uh, so specifically, strontium has three spinless isotopes that can form uh, dimers of multiple mass combinations, uh, supporting uh, hundreds of clock transitions. And uh, these could provide uh, really plenty of information on mass dependence across all bond lengths. Also, uh, various corrections have uh, different uh, asymptotic behavior with bond length, which can help distinguish, uh, for example, uh, uh, QED effects uh, from, uh, from new physics. So, um, uh, yeah, so uh, here's a, a brief uh, summary. Uh, here we have uh, created uh, samples of ultra cold uh, van der Waals molecules in their absolute ground state. We have used these molecules to uh, demonstrate a vibrational molecular lattice clock. Uh, and this clock now achieves um, a quality factor of approximately a trillion and a coherence time of 100 milliseconds across uh, nearly the entire molecular potential depth uh, with still a lot of potential for improvement. Um, this clock was first proposed some years ago for measurements of uh, slow uh, time variations of the electron to proton mass ratio or mu dot, uh, but we are also uh, very excited about its applications to these uh, sub part per trillion interatomic force measurements and the potential search uh, for, uh, for new mass dependent forces. Okay, 
So um, here, um, I would like to uh, take a moment to uh, thank my uh, graduate students who currently work uh, on these experiments. Um, in particular, I uh, hear uh, Khan and Emily have uh, contributed a lot of effort toward the, the molecular lattice clock. Um, and also, we, we wouldn't be anywhere near where we are now without our very dedicated theory colleagues, uh, Robert and Ivana um, at the University of Warsaw. Um, okay, and um, thank you very much for your attention. Um, and I'll be happy to uh, have uh, more discussion uh, about anything that I've mentioned today. All right, thank you very much, Tanya. Um, people can put questions in the Q&A or in the YouTube chat. Uh, we'll, we'll try to get to them. Um, maybe I'll start with a, a question from some of the panelists, which is related to something you were just talking about. Um, could you uh, open up any new directions by considering fermionic isotopes or mixed uh, isotopes uh, or, or species with uh, molecular species with mixed fermionic bosonic isotopes? Um, yeah, so our initial, uh, you know, hope is to expand from the, the one isotope to more bosonic isotopes, uh, because that way we can vary masses without complicating uh, the, the understanding of the force. Um, I think uh, when you start adding fermionic um, isotopes or making just fermion fermion pairs, uh, this becomes a spin dependent problem. Uh, and Firstly, it's a little bit more difficult, I think, to create the molecules and it's harder to get the same signal to noise, uh, et cetera. But um, the, I think the main uh, difficulty is that I think in a lot of these uh, experiments, you still need uh, a very good degree of uh, kind of theoretical interpretation. For example, let's, let's say you make some sort of king type plot where you plot some isotope shift versus uh, the, mass, the, the mass combination. Um, and, uh, and there you're looking for some deviation from a predicted trend, for example, nonlinearities. And it's important to be able to uh, at least isolate, for example, the mass dependent terms that you expect to deviate from linearity and estimate what they would be without new forces. And I think this becomes uh, much more challenging with uh, the isotopes that have nuclear spin. So um, yeah, this, this is not attempted yet, but potentially something for the future. And a, maybe a, a follow-up question to that um, also from the panel, which is, could you comment on the, uh, the ability to distinguish between uh, higher order molecular effects and uh, the new forces or new physics? Um, so the best uh, way I think for us to distinguish new physics from kind of um, misunderstood QED terms is by looking uh, not only at um, the different mass combinations, so we can scan the parameter space of masses potentially, but we also have another parameter space, which is the bond length, right? We can look at these uh, clock transitions uh, uh, from very tightly bound molecules to very loosely and anything in between. So this is sort of the R, right? The interatomic uh, separation. And generally uh, QED corrections have um, scalings in R that are kind of power law, um, maybe a one over R to the six or one over R to the four or one over R to the seven, depending on the physics. But uh, the idea is that new physics may be more likely to scale exponentially than as a power law. So um, looking, so having not only mass to vary, but also separation, and then looking for deviations as a function of that parameter, I think would uh, provide a very rich amount of information to separate the two contributions. Great, thank you. Um, we have a question from uh, Dima Budker. Uh, why would you interpret a new force as gravity rather than a new force associated with some new boson, or is this completely equivalent? Um, so I, I write it like this just because it's easy for me to understand, uh, you know, just put in a new term into the Newton's law. Um, I think uh, in most cases, uh, I think introducing a new boson may be equivalent, but I wonder if writing it just 
uh, as a Yukawa term, maybe a bit more general uh, in case the force is not uh, quantized in the way that you might expect. I, I don't know much about this, but um, I think that the way I wrote it is either equivalent or a bit more general. But yeah, if anybody has thoughts on this, I, I'm happy to discuss anytime. Okay, then uh, we had a question uh, from uh, James Dragan. Can you explain how the motional sidebands uh, help understand the polarizability of the subradiant states? Um, so what I meant is, uh, yeah, so these are, uh, So the, yeah, this uh, being able to have a narrow optical transition for the molecules and seeing its lattice sidebands is super helpful um, just to calibrate um, uh, anything uh, pretty much that depends on the trap depth. Uh, we're not so concerned about subradiant states in the context of the clock. So what we are concerned about is the, the clock states, right? And their polarizabilities are very important because we need to match them in order to have a magic trap. Okay, so that's super, um, super important. And um, so we like to do some, you know, ab initio calculations and measurements and try to compare the two. Uh, but the problem with uh, measuring absolute polarizabilities is that there's a dependence on your light intensity that the molecules see. And that's hard because um, it, it's a bit hard to know exactly, you know, how many watts per centimeter squared your molecules see. So it turns out that measuring the sidebands because that also depends on the light intensity that the molecules see. That way you can cancel out the, the, the actual intensity and just uh, make your polarizability measurement depend only on frequency measurements. And so that way uh, you get very precise uh, results. All right, thank you very much. Um, so uh, we can uh, take the rest of the questions uh, to the discussion. Uh, let's thank Tanya again for a very interesting talk. And uh, we have some uh, announcements. Uh, so the, uh, the post uh, seminar discussion uh, is at a link that's in the chat window. Um, and uh, do we do we have a slide to announce the next uh, next vamos? I don't think uh, normally we have the moderator do that, so I don't think we have one prepared. Uh, but we can probably go to the oh, left. So here's what I can say: uh, next week's quantum science uh, seminar speaker is uh, Yoshihiro Takahashi. Uh, so we invite you all to uh, to attend that talk, um, and uh, the uh, the Vamo speaker uh, is Julia Semagini from uh, Misha Lukin's group with some exciting new results from uh, from her tweezer experiment. So uh, please join us for the uh, for the after party. Right. Thanks a lot, John, and sorry Nick for not warning you ahead of time. <laughs> That's okay. It's my it's my first time doing this. Oops. No, no, it's not. It's, that's on me. <laughs>